So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Catherine Wilhelm, Executive Director of the US Asia Law Institute at the NYU School of Law. This is the first panel of the Institute's annual Timothy A. Gillott Dialogue on the Rule of Law in East Asia. And our theme this year is climate change in Asia Pacific. Over the course of four days, we are holding four virtual panels to examine various aspects of climate related law and governance. And today's topic is climate governance and the rule of law. This year is the 30th anniversary of the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro that gave us the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And over the past three decades, we've seen the countries of the world convene repeatedly to try to draft detailed rules uh, for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and taking other steps to mitigate climate change and to, um, to allow mankind to, to some extent, live with uh, the, the warming temperatures that we're seeing. But despite these prolonged and repeated negotiations and con conventions, we see We've seen this past year from the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the reports that they've been issuing, that the damage to the Earth's ecosystems are manifesting much more rapidly than we have been able to respond through the process of negotiating international agreements. So what we want to do in the next 90 minutes is take stock of climate law and governance regime as it has evolved since the 1992 Earth Summit. We're going to look first at the global level and then at the level of nation states to ask, what have we learned about what works and what doesn't work in terms of legal and governance institutions or approaches that successfully uh, motivate uh, nations, economies, uh, individuals to move forward in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and otherwise addressing the effects of climate change. Uh, and uh, it may be that um, even though we've failed to keep pace with global warming, we are nevertheless gaining valuable knowledge that will allow us at some point to sort of catch up uh, and get in front of the problem. So we're very honored to have with us five deeply knowledgeable speakers who have worked on climate change in various capacities as scholars, uh, policy advisors, and even activists at both the international and domestic levels. And I'll introduce them in alphabetical order. We have Navroz Dubash, who is a professor at the Center for Policy Research and a coordinating lead author of the UN uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that I just referenced. He's uh, part of the Working Group 3, which I believe is going to be issuing their report uh, very soon. Also, Tabitha Mallory, who is an affiliate faculty member of the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington and CEO of the consulting firm, China Ocean Institute. Uh, Jacqueline Peel, professor at Melbourne Law School and director of the Melbourne Climate Futures Initiative, who is also a lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 3. Uh, and also Oren Young, who is Distinguished Professor Emeritus at UC Santa Barbara's Wren School of Environmental Science and Management, and a world-renowned leader in the fields of international governance and environmental institutions. Now, obviously, there's much more that I could say about each of them, and there are many achievements and publications and honors, but I'm going to refer you to our website for the detail in order to give more time for them to speak. And so our format is, uh, as I mentioned, we're um, going to divide the time into two sections and we're structuring the program in the form of an extended conversation. So I'm going to begin by directing some questions at the speakers and inviting them to not only answer my questions but comment on each other's uh, responses. And I'll be looking for audience input throughout the program tonight. So not just at the end. Uh, so please, if you have a question on the international aspects of things, uh, do put your question into the Q&A panel. Um, the, please don't use the chat panel, use the Q&A panel to raise your questions. And um, if any of the speakers want to comment on something that's been said or make an uh, intervention of any kind, 
you could raise your, um, your hands, either physically raise your hands or even better, the, um, the, you click on the raise hand icon at the bottom of the screen and the yellow hand will come up. So, um, so to get right into it, um, my first question is about the process that we are following now that has evolved under the UN Framework Convention for trying to develop international climate change rules by convening these periodic massive conferences of the state's parties. We just saw it in Glasgow in November, COP26. And um, from the outside watching this on television and reading the reports, it seemed like a, an overwhelming sort of circus event, very hard to follow um, and very high pressure and very big stakes. But at the end, it was profoundly unclear to me whether we had made any progress or not. Um, this process itself has been heavily critiqued, obviously. And I'd like to ask each of you whether you are personally among the many critics of the COP process as it currently exists, where all the states come together in this once a year negotiation um, and make voluntary pledges with no penalties for failing to keep their pledges. Are you among those who think that this is a toothless process and therefore can't ever get us anywhere? Um, are there design changes that you would like to see, uh, large or small, that you think might be more effective in moving us forward quickly? Um, so I would guess if we do this alphabetically, um, we would start with you, uh, Navros. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for uh, including me on this panel, uh, Catherine. I really look forward to hearing uh, from my fellow panelists, uh, an extremely interesting and distinguished group. So thank you. Um, so I'll be brief on this one. Um, my sense is that we now have a kind of a cognitive lock-in to this process. It's been 30 odd years. It's very hard to even imagine another way of doing this. Uh, and, and, and maybe there are fresher minds than mine who, that, that can. Um, but my sense is that the nature of the process, which is steeped in UN conventions and so on and so forth, right? We have, we've sort of followed, we've, we've followed the ruts of how we've done this in, in, in other processes, non-environmental processes and, and so on. Uh, even within those confines, in a sense, we've approached this with a underlying assumption that the primary frame for climate change is, is a global collective action problem. So for 20 odd years, it's been, we have a global collective action problem. We have to, in a sense, allocate a pie of emissions in some sort of as explicit a way as possible. And that has proved to be an extremely hard lift, getting countries to agree a priori on what emissions they are willing to lock themselves into over a 20, 30, 40 year period uh, is beyond the, is, is stretching the bounds of, of domestic politics in most, uh, in most countries. So with the Paris Agreement, I think we made a bit of a flip, right? Where we said, well, let's have countries just move to what they can sustain within their own domestic political systems, and then let's get together and try to ratchet this up over time. And in a sense, I feel that the nature of the process is actually better suited to that second uh, uh, construct. And that second, con that second approach rather, and that second approach implicitly says, in addition to a global collective action problem, climate change is a problem that really uh, is about a series of national and local economic transformations. And that's, and, and both these things are of course true, right? If they're local uh, and national transformations, they can't proceed at their own sweet pace because we have a global clock, which is why we have the global collective action part of the framing. So we have to, in a sense, juggle these two framings and we have to design the process with an eye to both those framings. And we're muddling towards that, uh, uh, I feel, and thereby slowly making more use uh, of the international process. So let me pause there and, 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 uh, and wait to hear from others. But that's sort of a, an initial overarching observation. I could read your lips though, you said my name. <laughs> I think that's right, well done, yes. Yeah, um, so yeah, first of all, let me say also, uh, thanks so much to the NYU US Asia Law Institute for having me, uh, to Catherine Wilhelm for inviting me. Um, and I should, I should really issue a disclaimer too, that I, I am more of an ocean and fisheries expert than I am a climate change expert, but I think it makes sense to have someone who works on oceans here because 
of course, the intersection of, of climate change with ocean issues is, is huge for a number of reasons that maybe we'll get into later. Um, so uh, I think I'll say um, maybe some general remarks also kind of short about uh, um, more of these types of international fora and these discussions that happen because they happen, you know, not just climate change, but also there are a number of issues that are, um, uh, you know, dealt with through the UN framework at the international level um, for ocean and fisheries too. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, there are trade-offs with having that kind of format, um, but it's it's really important to have them because I think it sets the tone for the discussion. And so, you know, you get uh, the leadership of all really all the countries uh, kind of on the same page and, and you know, um, you know, to kind of borrow, I think, since this is, you know, we're talking so much about Asia, um, you know, for an event like this, uh, you know, the, the ASEAN way of, of process, which has been heavily criticized, but at the same time, you're kind of, you know, the process is the, is part of the uh, important thing, because you're getting people, you know, on the same page and just, you know, kind of identifying the issue, getting to know each other. Um, but I don't think it's enough to really manage all the issues. And so I, I do think, uh, you know, despite having kind of this, this high level, these high level meetings, it's so important also to have, uh, you know, engagements um, and action on all levels down to, you know, very local levels um, on these. But, you know, I think it is, you know, um, for all the people who are participating in, in processes like this, it's important to, um, you know, to kind of have the, um, in many cases, symbolic commitment of, of the leadership. Hmm. All right. So, um, Jackie. Thanks, Catherine. And, and thanks also to NYU and the Asia Institute for inviting me to be part of this discussion. I'm, I'm joining you from Australia and I just want to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking today from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nations and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. That's something we usually do at the start of events in Australia, recognising the strong Indigenous culture here and also the important contribution that Indigenous knowledge plays in the climate governance space. Um, just wanted to echo some of the comments um, from Tabitha and Navroz. Um, even though I think COP26 attracted a lot more attention to the Conference of the Parties process than we might have seen previously, this is a, a format or process that's been ongoing now for, for 30 years. Uh, and as Tabitha pointed to, is is entrenched, if you like, in other parts of our international environmental governance system. So I think there is a bit of cognitive lock-in, as you said, Nevros, to this kind of process. Um, I think with the Paris Agreement, we have seen um, a change and COP26 was the first time countries were really gathering um, under the auspices of the Paris Agreement framework because the meeting that was due to be held in 2020 was postponed due, due to COVID. Um, one of the things that's quite different about the Paris Agreement framework is uh, its universal obligations uh, that are created for states. So unlike the Kyoto Protocol, which was sort of the predecessor that had a differentiated obligations for developed countries and developing countries, with Paris there is um, universal uh, obligations placed on all states. So all states are required to go through this domestic process of producing their nationally determined contributions to the global climate response. Um, I think the process has some uh, obviously clear uh, pathologies to it that were on full display at Glasgow, but also some real benefits. Speaking from the Asia Pacific region, particularly in the Pacific, one of the key um, benefits of the process has been um, its collective nature and the fact that it enables voices um, from very small states uh, in the Pacific here, we're surrounded by small island states. They've been quite effective at collectively voicing concerns through the UN COP processes in a way that probably wouldn't occur in sort of smaller broken off forums. Um, and just a final comment, Catherine, because you asked about progress that was made at COP. There's been a lot of analyses of COP26, um, but there are some signs of progress in the Glasgow Climate Pact, which was the consensus document produced at the end. 
uh, particularly sort of calling for an accelerated pace of action and countries having to return to the next COP at the end of this year with um, uh, updated 2030 targets, revisited and, and strengthened, which could be really significant. Uh, and even though it was a collective process, I think uh, Glasgow was characterised by quite a lot of side deals um, and sideline agreements that emerged during the process. So the Glasgow Climate Pact itself, um, reflecting the consensus nature, um, nature of the decision, does have um, some weaker language, particularly around phasing out coal-fired power. But um, some of the sideline deals are on issues like methane emissions, um, coal financing, coal power, where you had smaller groups of countries coming together um, were quite uh, indications that the process can still sort of um, uh, walk and chew gum at the same time, if you like to use an American saying, that uh, you could have both a collective program progress occurring and also perhaps deeper cooperation in some of these uh, side agreement areas. Professor Young. You, you can call me Lauren. Um, let me add my thanks to you for organizing this and let me second Jackie's uh, comments about Indigenous people and Indigenous knowledge. Let me begin by drawing a distinction between governance on the one hand, in particular mechanisms or processes on the other hand. Governance is about societal steering. How can we steer societies to avoid collectively bad outcomes and achieve collectively good outcomes? Historically, when we, particularly in the Western world, been dealing with governance challenges or governance processes at the international level, we've tended to take it for granted that the proper mechanism or the proper process is to focus on international and legally binding instruments. And that is what we have done with respect to a variety of issues, including a variety of marine issues. Um, and with some successes and some failures. And that's what we began to do with the climate problem. So it's now 30 years from the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And I would say by and large, that our experience with this particular process, this particular mechanism for steering has been, to put it as positively as possible, highly disappointing. By and large, this mechanism hasn't proved successful. And so you ask yourself the question, but is this the only mechanism or is this the only process? There are other ways to address governance problems, governance challenges. And in fact, what we are seeing in the context of the climate issue we still say, oh, it's COP this, it's COP that, it's under the UNFCCC, but we are experiencing, certainly since Copenhagen in 2009, the kind of branching out to begin, perhaps gingerly, to explore a variety of other mechanisms or processes. Um, and so I think that uh, this is where we're at now, and this is the challenge, I think the whole issue of um, moving forward, not by legally binding instruments, but by pledges is an interesting one. Many people say um, pledges like the nationally determined contributions or the global methane pledge. Many people say pledges are kind of um, very weak. I mean, people pledge this and that, and it doesn't make any difference. But in some circumstances, um, pledges do make a difference. Sometimes people internalize pledges. And sometimes people think that the pledge is simply a beneficial initiative from their point of view. Sometimes people think pledges are important because they want to get a reputation for saying, 
my word is my bond. So pledges uh, are one other mechanism which we tend to explore as other kinds of side deals, various kinds of subgroups, side deals. Uh, for example, the US-China um, agreement or the US-China um, um, document that was signed. I think that's an interesting development. There may be possibilities for other kinds of subgroups to move forward. So what I want to argue in this context is that we're not get hung up on one particular process growing out of the UNFCCC, but that we now say in view of the emergency quality of the climate problem, we need to be actively exploring the widest possible range of processes and mechanisms. And just to finish up, I, mean, I would say that we are now in a situation where the climate problem is now a very real climate emergency. Um, and therefore we need to be thinking about things like, um, is there a possibility to really push hard on things like short-lived climate pollutants? Can we buy time by really pushing on the methane issue, for example, and do it through uh, the Global Methane Pledge, if that's what works. Um, it's fine to gather together at COPs, but don't think that COPs are any more just about how to implement the UNFCCC. Hmm. Well, several of you have mentioned the side pledges. Um, and so I'm wondering, how do they actually work? Are any of them binding? Um, so I, I was reviewing yesterday the US-China document, the statement that they issued. And of course, there was nothing binding in it. Um, it repeatedly said, you know, the two governments intend to do this and intend to do that. And initially, you know, when I saw all of this, what looked to be specifics, they intend to um, set standards for this and they intend to explore standards for, it seemed particularized, but then you sort of realized it was all very fuzzy. Um, there seemed to be much less there than, um, than at first glance, nothing at all. Um, the only specific commitment was to hold a meeting in the first half of this year, actually. Um, does anybody know whether the two governments, the US and Chinese governments are actually following through and have any preparations in the works to hold that meeting, by the way, before June or at any point before COP27. I just throw that in case you do. I, I, I don't know if any of you are uh, up observing that closely what's going on um, between the two, the two, the two country, the governments. But a, an agreement like that, I'm very curious what significance it really has I wondered whether its real significance was to somehow send a signal at Glasgow to all of the other states that the two biggest emitting countries were, you know, were there and were talking to each other. Uh, Oren, please. I, I, I followed it really recently, but I know that in the aftermath of Glasgow, there were very serious ongoing conversations between people at the most senior level in the US and in China. Uh, I do fear that the current crisis um, will have um, side effects. They will uh, influence the situation in a detrimental fashion. And that I think is a very, um, very real concern. But um, that said, I mean, in the US China case, first of all, in the China case, we know that it's not about what the um, Chinese government per se says, it's what the leadership of the um, CPC says. And if the leadership of the CPC is committed, something will happen as far as China is concerned. On the other hand, in the US case, we know that there's no chance whatsoever in the foreseeable future of congressional 
legislative action on climate change. So the best we can hope for is executive action. Um, at the moment, my guess is that um, this is not day to day at this point in time at the top of the agenda of the US leadership. I mean, we have a president who's in Brussels at the moment dealing with a crisis. So I'm not so worried about the non-binding quality. I am very worried about the extent to which uh, other issues and intervening crises can move an issue like this uh, off the front burner. Right. Navros. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I, I don't um, I don't have enough information to focus specifically on the on the example of the US China statement and, and or, or the methane pledge in particular, but I thought it'd be useful to reflect a little bit more on the the, the general role of these pledges and then also the, the, the fact that they coexist in a sense within the within the uh, or alongside the, the framework convention uh, process. Um, you know, in an interesting, uh, uh, many of you will know that actually the UN process, there was a fork in the road back in 1991, and Japan had proposed a pledge and review system in 1991. Uh, and interestingly, it was the environmental NGOs that said, this is toothless, these pledges are meaningless. Um, and I was, you know, uh, part of civil society uh, action back then, part of the Climate Action Network. And I always could look back on that as a historical mistake, because in a sense, we had time in 1991 to make the pledge and review system work. We had time uh, to have countries put out pledges and work their way through national political systems. We've now adopted something close to a pledge and review system when time is really short. And actually one of the problems we have is that countries are being asked to up their pledges before the earlier pledge had had a chance to actually be implemented and work its way through the system. So we now have a architecture that is somewhat inconsistent with the urgency of the uh, of the problem. But back in 1991, it would have been uh, uh, more consistent. This is just with the benefit of hindsight. But I think part of the problem is we're looking at these pledges uh, through one instead of kind of you know two lenses. A lot of times it's about are these pledges a way of naming and shaming encouraging countries to do more peer pressure, those sorts of metaphors, right? And I think that's, I think all of those naming, shaming and peer pressure metaphors went out the window with President Trump, uh, assisted with uh, by, by Mr. Bolsonaro and Morrison and, and, and other, other such leaders, right? The, w w what's the use of shaming language when there are countries that, that, that explicitly disavow the importance of, of, of climate change? I mean, we might be in a slightly different context now, um, but I think the more, so, so maybe, yes, there'll be some of that, but the more important role of these pledges is actually in stimulating domestic processes. So when you create a methane pledge, you start having a conversation internally. When India, for example, put out its, its nationally determined contribution, it led to a whole conversation before that pledge and subsequent to that pledge on whether and how we can meet these things. And the hope is that these pledges will lead to a virtuous cycle where we collectively in, well, separately and then collectively realize that these changes are more feasible than we thought. And we get on a virtuous cycle where politics lines up behind things that are proven to be a lower cost than others thought. New interests come into the picture. They find an avenue to express themselves at the domestic level and so on. So if we take that part, and I think that part of the pledge process has been more important uh, um, uh, in a sense, or it's, it's, the, it's the start of the cycle, if you like. The second part of the cycle is then getting uh, um, those pledges ramped up by demonstrating their success uh, uh, and spreading uh, across other, other geographies. But if we buy that argument, then we should be thinking about the international process and its design somewhat differently. We should be asking the question, how do we design this in a way that stimulates national action, national deliberation, and so on and so forth, right? So then things like the technical expert uh, review part of the UNFCC, the transparency part of the UNFCC, these parts become really, really uh, important. Um, and, and indeed the setting of pledges, the creation of long-term strategies, all of these hooks uh, and, and little ledges that are created for national politics, uh, by the international process become really important 
And so the, the, the language of toothlessness is less salient. It's really about shifting national politics and providing scope and space and uh, angles of advantage for domestic actors. And I think that's actually a really fruitful way uh, to, to look at the pledges. Um, I don't want to take too much time, so, but I want to come back briefly on the UNFCC itself. I mean, um, maybe just, just one, one, one or two sentences and then you can, Catherine, you can tell me if we should come back to this. I think the UNFCC, as it was originally constructed, uh, and Jacqueline was alluding to this, plays a really important role in providing a voice for small islands and, and other countries, but it also plays a really important narrative shaping role. And I can talk about this more later, but for example, the coal story and the pushback against the coal story, which I think is actually quite fascinating, um, uh, provides a really good example of that. And the insistence on common but differentiated responsibility. And here I would, I guess, Jack, uh, Jack is the international lawyer here, so I hesitate, um, but I think the, framing of the Paris Agreement as having shifted entirely to a universal obligation versus differentiation may be somewhat incomplete. You know, I just did a quick search. CBDR or common but differentiated responsibility is, is, is certainly uh, uh, strategically planted throughout the, uh, the Paris Agreement and is not going anywhere, uh, is my understanding. So the fact that developed and developing countries continue to uh, um, uh, to bring different circumstances to this conversation, and those circumstances matter, I think is still very much part of the pol political logic uh, of the of the uh, um, uh, of the global conversation. And I think there's a good reason for that. Actually, we can talk a little bit more about that uh, if you if you wish later. Thanks. Great. So Jackie, and then Tabitha. Um, I'll keep my comments brief, but just responding to that provocation from Navros to say his, his comments are absolutely correct. That was an oversimplification of the Paris Agreement. It is the case that all countries are required to submit nationally determined contributions rather than a set of countries having target requirements and another um, other a different set of obligations for developing countries. Um, but there are certainly elements of differentiation that remain very strongly embedded in the Paris Agreement. And we've really seen a lot of the negotiations turn towards this question, particularly at COP26, um, in the context of discussions, particularly on finance, um, because of the need for um, financial flows to go to developing countries in particular to assist with meeting mitigation and adaptation commitments. I just wanted to comment, uh, Catherine, you put forward on the US-China agreement um, issue during COP26, the hypothesis that that was perhaps intended as a bit of a prompt uh, in the negotiations. And I think there is something to that hypothesis. The, the timing and the secrecy surrounding it before it was released did certainly indicate that the parties were hoping that it would sort of have a, a, an unblocking effect uh, at a point in the negotiations where there'd been some uncertainty about whether Glasgow was going to come out with a consensus decision at all. Um, it, it probably had less effect than than the, the parties uh, assumed. Um, I just also wanted to pick up on one of um, the comments from Oren about um, side deals and the capacity for these sort of other governance forums to emerge subgroups and sideline deals and, um, and some of the greater flexibility that might provide for progress on climate change. I think we're seeing that phenomenon emerging beyond the the interstate context. Um, we're also seeing that in other transnational groupings, particularly um, transnational groupings of business actors, um, transnational social movements that are emerging, where you can see this similar kind of subgrouping effect, but outside of, of states. And there's a lot of thought at the moment into how those sorts of processes can also help to take action forward, particularly if, if countries are, are bogged down in domestic processes. Uh, and the final point, we might get to some of this a little bit more in the domestic section, Catherine, but um, uh, Navros, you were saying perhaps the time of naming and shaming is, is sort of where beyond that a little bit. I, I think sitting in a country that has been labelled one of the bad actors in the space, Australia, under our current uh, government, 
which dragged its heels, if you like, on, on commitments going into COP. Um, it, there was a, a level to which the international pressure that was exerted uh, and the um, intense scrutiny of the government's policies going into COP26, I think really was pivotal in uh, bringing government to the table with at least a 2050 uh, target, net zero by 2050, which now sounds uh, uh, very yesterday, but that was important in the domestic political process uh, to have that international pressure and the sort of continual cycle of the COPs um, provides a point for those national conversations to occur. Mm -hmm. Tabitha. Yeah, so um, I, uh, I, I kind of want to riff a little bit off of um, what was said in the first round and then just again now. And, and I think this is a good place to put this. I think it takes the conversation in kind of like a, a different place, but um, it's something I was thinking about in the lead up to this panel. And, um, you know, it has to do with uh, kind of the big picture of governance in general. And then, you know, the other panelists, you know, talked about motivations for the pledges. Navarroche talk, talked about, you know, just kind of some of the issues with leadership. Um, you know, Jackie was talking about kind of underscoring Oren's point about the importance of other actors. And so, um, you know, because it's pretty early on in this event, I just, I kind of wanted to um, put this out there. So when we're thinking about governance um, from kind of a big picture uh, and also in relation to Asia, um, I think, you know, one good way of understanding governance, I mean, there's a lot of definitions out there, um, but, you know, one way to think of it, so, you know, Orrin was kind of talking about a definition of it, but it, to me, it's, it's both the set of institutions and mechanisms, you know, and process to aggregate and balance the, essentially the individual um, plus the collective in terms of their needs and interests, right? And, and there's an inherent tension in that. Because uh, you know we're all at once an individual, but also part of a larger community, or or many of them, um, and so there's you know there's a lot of literature on governance, um, and and but one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately, um, and just kind of one of the you know deep rooted problems here is, you know what got me thinking about this was Putin's invasion of of Ukraine, uh, and it's you know that our really our contemporary human society, and we think about governing that society, we have to some extent. Um, not worked enough on the role that human cognition and psychology play in governance or even what the, you know, kind of the philosophical, religious, spiritual underpinnings of, of governance are. Um, and so when we're, we're talking about kind of the building blocks of governance, so, you know, the norms, rules, and laws, uh, you know, these are all shaped by the way humans think, uh, essentially. And so, you know, we don't have, for example, a good way of dealing with um, the way that power uh, can negatively affect leaders. So, you know, maybe about 10 years ago, there were some researchers who coined the term um, hubris syndrome. So it's essentially an acquired form of narcissistic personality disorder. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that the, you know, the literature provides some discussion of like the role of leaders and personality, you know, you see this kind of in like, you know, for IR theory, you know, classical realism talks about it, certainly some strands of constructivism. Um, but a lot of that material is descriptive and not prescriptive. Um, so it's not about what we should do. Um, and so, you know, because some of this came up in the discussion already, you know, ego and image reputation is a really great motivator. Um, but at, you know, at a certain point, uh, you know, it becomes the main motivator um, and whatever, you know, kind of good ideas or products or performance or deliverables that kind of accompany it or that are generated really just become a byproduct. Um, so in, at an extreme, you, this is how you get people like Putin destroying an entire country. Um, yeah. And um, so uh, I think, you know, I, just, I don't think we have enough um, of the kind of thinking yet that is, you know, thinking that we're all in this together and we're not going to really get solutions on climate change without addressing some of that fundamental thinking. And, and so, you know, it's important to, you know, uh, not just have the, the state actors and leaders, but also these other actors, because I think we're starting to see some of that more, you know, ecological thinking. Um, and there's, um, there are a lot of traditions in Asia uh, that speak to this, you know, a lot of like wisdom traditions. Um, and I think they have also been very much overlooked. Um, so, you know, traditions like Taoism, Buddhism, Shintoism. Um, and it's, you know, I think in many ways it's because, 
they're less forceful compared to some of the, you know, the more predominant ways of thinking. So, you know, in the West, we just have a lot of em em emphasis on the individual and this idea of like humans dominating nature. Um, and even in China today, you know, it's a, it's a very Confucian way of thinking about the world, very hierarchical. I mean, it's kind of a forceful, you know, way of thinking of it. And, you know, something like Taoism talks more about how the, the individual is, uh, part of a bigger system, you know, so it, it really is an ecological approach or, or like an ecosystem based approach right. Um, uh, you know, just kind of focusing on humility and simplicity. Um, and so, you know, there's also examples from Asia that aren't, you know, like 2000 years old uh, or more, um, you know, just like the Asian development model, which, you know, through laws and regulations essentially prioritize the long term gains of everyone over the short term gains of just, you know, a few. And so, you know, to me, it's encouraging to see, uh, you know, the initiative taken by people kind of outside, um, you know, this, the COP mechanism and, and, and other, you know, uh, structures, you know, for like ocean and fisheries, for example, just, you know, you know, especially like a lot of young people taking the initiative to um, address some of these problems. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to, you know, to kind of underscore this. I mean, I don't think it's new for anybody. I mean, we've all, you know, we've all kind of, you know, thought of this example, of, you know, this point about how, you know, traditional Western art focuses on the individual and you look at, you contrast it to the traditional Chinese art and it's the landscape, you know. Um, but I, I do think that um, we forget uh, about that, um, that, you know, that kind of important point um, when we're thinking about climate change. So, sorry, it's a bit of a digression, but I just kind of wanted to, um, tie up some points that were, were said earlier. Right. Well, if, if we did share a more communitarian perspective on things, then I think that we would be finding it easier to come together at COPS for, uh, for sure. Tabitha, one of the things you mentioned just now was um, Ukraine and the invasion there. And I did want, before we leave the international arena and go to the uh, focus on what happens at the level of nations, uh, I wanted to see what people are thinking now about the impact on this process of the war going on now in Ukraine, because obviously um, it is um, pushing up the prices of fossil fuels and causing governments to be very anxious about holding those, you know, increasing supply so that prices can at least not go higher or maybe be driven down a bit. They're very worried about uh, voters being upset here in the United States. We have elections in November. So there's a lot of concern about uh, voters being upset about the gas prices. And I'm wondering what this will mean for states to improve on their pledges um, and the reporting process that's supposed to go on between now and the next COP. Uh, do we think that there's going to be uh, more backsliding or simply uh, non-action or just as uh, was just suggested, I'm forgetting now uh, from, from who, is simple inattention. Um, maybe this was you or I mean, how many things can an administration focus on? And if they're busy focused on Ukraine, then um, climate plans are not going to be getting uh, top level attention. So how s seriously harmful could this be for the climate process? Uh, Oren. So I worry about two things, Catherine. W one is this question of the crisis um, dominating the political space and the attention and the energy of leadership to the extent of pushing other things off the agenda. And the second thing is um, this tendency to try to find sort of quick fixes to what's obviously going to be an energy, short-term energy crisis. And the usual response is to, well, what can we do quickly to increase um, energy and keep the crisis from going through the roof? I mean, you might argue that this is a golden opportunity. Why not really take this chance to push hard on renewables and turn the corner. But I think that's optimistic and I really worry that the crisis is gonna be a setback. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I think now we do need to switch um, to the domestic focus. And it makes sense to think domestically because as has been observed already, any of these um, pledges or commitments that are taken by states at 
COP 2026 20, uh, or other meetings ultimately have to be translated at home into either a domestic laws or regulations or perhaps into incentive systems, market-based incentive systems like carbon trading schemes or other kinds of uh, mechanisms by which the governments can try to uh, coordinate domestic action that will allow them to achieve their targets, their emission targets and other targets. So I'm wondering in this space as well, what has been learned uh, in the, the past 30 years about effective climate governance regimes inside countries? And are they replicable? Can states learn from each other to strengthen their own climate governance institutions? So for example, in the Asia Pacific region, in the last few years, a number of countries have established emissions trading schemes. Uh, and some of them also have uh, issued uh, plans uh, of one kind or another, for example, um, methane plans, uh, other kinds of uh, climate uh, programs or plans of an executive nature or more of a political nature. Um, are any of these um, useful, uh, apparent, you know, seeming to have effect, to take effect, to be effective? And would they offer promising uh, lessons for others in the region to imitate? Um, uh, th thanks so much. So, so, um, so I think it's important just as even as we pivot to this domestic uh, kind of uh, 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 question to constantly keep in mind, I mean, when we were talking about the international, I was pointing to the domestic and now the, the domestic, I'm going to point to the international in the sense that we have to, I think, really keep in mind the interactive uh, uh, the possibilities for for positive interaction uh, um, uh, 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 across these, and um, so so I think I'm, I'm going to start by basically making the the, the point that um, uh, just maybe pick off where, where, from from what Jackie said about about Australia, and I think that they the, the fact that the international process has helped nudge politics. In Australia is is uh, is wonderful, but I think it really is because there are probably Australian constituencies that use that pressure productively, right? So it has to be filtered through domestic politics. You can't. The point is you can't bypass domestic politics. It has to. You have to find ways of working within domestic politics, and and that basic starting point that we should be thinking about narrative frames, institutions coalitions etc that shift domestic politics using the international in a, a where where helpful uh, and where useful uh, in the manner i talked about earlier through sort of you know transparency rules and so on and so forth that's kind of the, the the framing that i find most productive and so with that sort of broad context to get to your your question i think there has been a lot of diffusion across countries uh, of models uh, my favorite is actually um even more than emissions trading is the spread now of both climate, national climate laws, as well as knowledge based commissions like the UK Climate Change Commission, which is proliferating across different jurisdictions, but in ways that uh, reflect kind of national political conversations and in some ways the weakness of consensus around around climate change. So some commissions are, uh, are, are far less uh, are far more toothless and, and less well equipped than the UK one. Uh, some have uh, different roles. So for example, in the UK, it's about setting uh, or recommending carbon budgets. In other countries, it's about recommending sectoral uh, linkages um, between climate and other objectives. So that that embedding of, so, so you may have institutional transplant, but that embedding within a national context I think is really important uh, for the longevity and the success uh, of, of these institutions. We also see a lot of relatively thoughtless international transplant. Um, so for example, we see, uh, you know, I think, uh, 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 and, and this is true of climate laws. So the UK climate law is now being ported to other countries in ways that frankly worries me a little bit, uh, because I'm not sure the domestic political consensus exists yet for a structure that says, let's set five yearly carbon budgets. 
uh, and, and then enforce those, those budgets. Um, because as soon as you get some losers uh, from the allocation of those budgets, you're going to get a pushback against it. And I think Australia is a, a case of uh, perhaps a climate law that, that didn't have the political consensus to sustain it. Um, so we've tried to look at this in a, in a recent project that I did, sort of eight or so countries and their domestic political institutions that came out in environmental uh, politics. And one of the things we propose is that it may be useful to think about a ratchet-like structure even in domestic climate institutions. So you build institutions that are consistent with the kind of political support that exists at a particular moment in time. And those institutions and their operation over time can actually lead to scope for broadening that support and leading to more uh, uh, um, uh, potent institutions or institutions with greater uh, uh, authority and, and, and power uh, to implement. But it's important to get that balance uh, right and then over time move in the direction of, of, of uh, uh, institutions that are better able to kind of drive through, uh, drive through change. So that balance between the political context, the institutional structure, and the narrative within which that's embedded. So in some countries, you will have a carbon first narrative around carbon budgets. In other countries, you may very much have a co-benefits narrative that says, uh, look, you know, the air pollution opportunities of climate change that, that are related to climate change are so huge. In other countries, such as South Africa, uh, it's basically very strongly driven by a jobs narrative. Can we tell a green growth story and a job creation story? And that is what will animate politics then your institutions have to take seriously the question of bringing together mitigation and jobs. So your institution and its and its uh, its imperatives are structured in a sense by what works politically. So that intersection between these things, between the narrative, between the politics and the institutional structure, I think is 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 a, is a framework that that I find helpful when thinking about domestic um, climate governance. Right. Well, I I think it's clear that in the U.S. we've failed to have a narrative that catches on. Uh, the Biden administration has been trying to make it about jobs, but somehow has not been able to get that narrative to be accepted uh, or to make it stick. Um, Jackie? Yeah, look, I, I was uh, reflecting um, as Navarro was speaking there, he, he mentioned the Australian experience, which is, is perhaps an in indication of what not to do for effective climate governance rather than what to do. Um, we did in fact have uh, a climate law, a Clean Energy Act, which was repealed by an incoming government of a different flavour and then we've had a bit of a, um, uh, a, a lack of uh, uh, legislation or governance, at least at the national level. Um, what that has produced, and I think this is characteristic also of the United States at various periods, has been a proliferation of governments in other areas, not at the subnational level in particular. Um, so while we don't have a national climate law in Australia, we do have quite strong state level uh, environmental and climate laws, which in many ways replicate the trend that Navros was talking about, about having um, climate change legislation and accompanying commissions that, that regularly uh, revisit um, questions about what the targets should be in particular. Um, I think uh, I also would echo Navros's point about the importance of international pressure being filtered through domestic policy processes and domestic constituencies um, in countries like Australia, might be less so in other countries in the Asia Pacific, but in Australia, there is a very strong domestic civil society um, that is able to quite effectively uh, take and translate the international pressure and international messages and use that for creating domestic change. Um, the regional context is also quite important. So there's been a lot of pressure brought to bear from our regional neighbours, particularly Pacific uh, Islands, in um, the forums in which the Australian and New Zealand government participate with Pacific Island neighbours. Um, and the final thing that I just wanted to pull out was uh, that uh, 
which we've, we're sort of implicitly talking in the comments so far about governance for climate change mitigation, so reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, but there's also really important questions around what should be the effective frameworks for climate change adaptation. Um, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, the Working Group 2, which looks particularly at impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, in their report did call out uh, the need for effective governance systems for adaptation and at least in the Australasian region um, signalled that uh, inadequate uh, government governance systems was one of the factors that was um, adding to climate risk in the region. So it definitely is a question that we need to solve not just in the mitigation sphere but also for climate adaptation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tabitha, um, I invite you to answer my question. Also, I wanted to um, urge you to maybe talk a bit about um, something that you mentioned to me in an email, uh, the, the idea that the South China Sea, um, which is, as we know, a major uh, geopolitical dispute focus, is also potentially a focus of climate change concern. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'll talk about that. And then, uh, well, I'll start off by saying, you know, we're thinking about um, domestic politics, or really, I think, you know, domestic solutions and initiatives. Um, uh, and, and both Jackie and Navarosh talked a little bit about some of these, but um, I really do think the um, sub national initiatives are, are very promising. Um, so, you know, from the perspective of the United States, I live, I'm not in Seattle right now, but I, I live in Seattle. And you know, Washington State, um, and you know, the, Washington has been pretty proactive in addressing a, a whole bunch of environmental issues. Um, you know, not just at the state level, but I think there's, um, you know, kind of the. I'm doing a project right now looking at the um, Cascadia bioregion and how that can be a, a model for, you know, a blue economy initiatives. We have a lot of, and it's, you know, it's a really interesting. Um, intersection with climate change, I mean, it poses some, some challenges too. Um, you know, we have uh, a bunch of different stakeholders, also indigenous, you know, population who, you know, um, have their own systems of managing fisheries, uh, uh, you know, and, you know, big fishing industry, ports, um, you know, very robust, you know, kind of um, uh, natural, you know, environment there. Uh, and, you know, we've been getting a lot of our energy from the hydroelectric, dam hydroelectric dams, but, you know, those are also problem problematic. So it'll be interesting, I think, um, you know, for that region uh, overall to come up with the next solution for our energy needs, uh, because, you know, the dams aren't doing it, they're too harmful for it for the salmon. Um, uh, so, it's, you know, it's a challenge, but I also think um, the process through which, you know, that region resolves some of these issues will serve as a model. And I think that's, um, what's nice about a lot of these subnational initiatives is, you know, they're locally based, kind of organically grown uh, models that can't really be replicated exactly in other places. And I think it is foolish to try, um, but you know, you could take pieces of them and get ideas from them. And I think that's been, you know, really great. Um, and I can go on about that. There's like a, you know, Maritime Blue initiative on the ports, you know, in Seattle, and uh, just a lot of um, kind of interesting uh, work. But uh, and oh, also because our Chinese uh, panelist is not able to join us, uh, I think I'll, I'll say, you know, China has a really interesting system for innovating solutions too, which is, you know, this, this idea that uh, at the, the provincial levels, you know, and lo lower levels too, people are, have been free to experiment with, with different solutions to problems and then, you know, as a kind of pilot projects and then if those work out, um, you know, they can be kind of expanded to other places as appropriate, which I think is, you know, it's kind of another example of, of this kind of like proof of concept model system that you can develop. Um, and, you know, speaking of, of US-China, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there, there had been a lot of initiatives kind of at the subnational level kind of partnerships, you know, with, the, you know, from states and lower and provinces and lower to, you know, in, engage in, in some projects. And I, I think, unfortunately, a lot of that has, has, um, Gone by the wayside with both the pandemic and the increase in, in U.S. China tensions, uh, but you know, speaking of, of regionally and kind of regional solutions to problems, so that, yeah, the South China Sea I think is is a really interesting example. If you know, if you can kind of get the political will together, um, where you know you have uh, some I think some really innovative ideas that go beyond you know what we've 
been used to in terms of the international system, um, you know, with legally binding agreements and everything. Um, and uh, some of these are, you know, for example, um, they've been called, uh, you know, post sovereignty or meta sovereignty ideas for handling places like the Spratly features, you know, could you, you know, so, um, uh, so for, you know, there's a lot of talk right now, maybe we'll get into this later about um, how to establish uh, area-based management systems for the ocean, you know, so um, there's some negotiations going on about that. Um, you know, in marine protected areas, those are generally established at a national level, and there's not really a good mechanism to do it internationally. Um, but if you could get states, for example, the claimant states around the South China Sea to agree to create, you know, like a peace park and, and set it aside, and this is kind of what is an example of, of you know, one of these post-sovereignty arrangements. Um, uh, that, you know, I, th I think those are some really great solutions, if, you know, and, and I think a really big part of this, um, you know, if we think about the, you know, Catherine, your question about Ukraine earlier, um, I, you know, it, I think it really has, you know, the energy plays such a huge role in that conflict and, and kind of Russia's calculation about, you know, what to do. And, and I really do think um, it underscores how urgent it is that we move away from fossil fuels. Uh, and so for the South China Sea, you know, just, just given um, how dire the situation is globally with climate change, I mean, a lot of those countries still want to drill for hydrocarbon in the seabed and you know it's it's a very challenging issue because you know especially the smaller states like vietnam philippines uh you know it's 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 difficult to just overnight transition to renewable energies but i mean if i think it would just be great not just in the south china sea but really elsewhere in the world i mean there's overwhelming evidence that any kind of drilling in the seabed you know usually at some point there is a disaster um and it's it, devastating to the the um the marine environment um and so you know we have so many deep water horizon you know is a good example um and uh you know so get so you know getting the commitment for you know the states there and globally i think to agree to not drill for uh hydrocarbon in the seabed no more oil drilling i, I just think would would be great but it's going to take a lot of you know, energy and ideas to offset, you know, the 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 need for um, kind of the fossil fuel based, you know, technology that we have um, and come up with other renewable solutions. Um, so hopefully there's some, you know, some people with a lot of energy and ideas <laughs> listening to our conversation and thinking about ways to make this possible. Right, right. Uh, Oren, perhaps you have one. I'm getting messages that my connection is unstable. So if I cut out, just move on. <laughs> but um, on the domestic uh, front, my experience, um, Catherine, is that domestic governance systems differ greatly. Even when they use the same terminology and appear to have similarities, when you drill down, mm. you discover that domestic systems are very different in the way they address even similar kinds of problems. So my central message here is that you need to get different countries, different players to commit to do something, but then give them the greatest amount of leeway possible to achieve the goals in their own ways, to use what works within their domestic systems. That said, it may be that we can introduce some useful distinctions. For example, it seems to me that there's a useful distinction between systems which tend to deal with problems through lawmaking, legislation, implementing regulations, governance mechanisms, systems that tend to operate through planning processes, goal setting, um, prioritizing, um, making plans, bringing centralizing resources to bear. These are two very different systems, very different approaches. Uh, they work quite differently. I think there's also a very significant difference between systems which tend to be highly centralized 
in systems which are somewhat more decentralized. Tabitha was talking about the US system, but uh, which I think is an interesting model for some countries and has promise, uh, but for much more highly centralized systems like the Chinese system, that's not, I think, likely to be the way forward. I think there may also be an interesting distinction that's useful in some cases between those kinds of societies in which we tend to think about benefits and costs. We tend to think about incentive systems. Um, we tend to think about things like markets um, and, and so forth and so on. But there are other kinds of societies where that is not the typical way in which those societies address um, issues of this kind. Chabot has spoke before about some of the Asian models and the focus in a confusion world on education and on sort of norms and principles and so on. I think it's interesting that China has adopted a nationwide um, um, a cap and trade system. Um, China, by the way, had some pilot projects which were miserable failures. And they're now going to do it nationally. My guess is it'll be a miserable failure and that they will turn to other kinds of mechanisms. So two messages. One is uh, domestic systems vary tremendously, especially when you dig down and get beneath the surface uh, terminological similarities. But secondly, there may be some useful analytic distinctions which are helpful and which we need to think hard about if we're going to get different countries to maximize the extent to which they actually do take seriously their nationally determined contributions. So given the wide variety that you're speaking of, um, then you seem to be saying we shouldn't be thinking, we shouldn't be looking for models. We shouldn't be looking for, God forbid, best practices that we try to push at, at states. But could there be supports that either the, the UN, the Secretariat for the Framework Convention, or um, other UN bodies or other international organizations could provide? to individual states, governments, to support them in developing their domestic governance institutions or to help them to even uh, get on top of, to, to learn about the variety of, say, legislation that has been developed around the world and so on. Because this is challenging, even for, we were talking before about how you know, the Biden administration, the US government has limited attention spans to focus on both climate change and Ukraine, you know, in the same week, well, even more challenging to small governments with, you know, smaller uh, bureaucracies and so on. Are there support systems that could be provided nonetheless, even though they wouldn't be pushing a, a model or a toolkit or a open the box uh, solution? And um, I'm sorry, I, I neglected to catch the correct order in which people's hands went up, but I want to go back to you, Oren, since I'm sort of responding to something you said, and then I'll come back to Navros and Jackie. Let me be quick to give other people a chance, but I think the answer, Catherine, is yes. And let me give two uh, examples. One is uh, in terms of capacity building and technology transfer. I think we really need to focus on appropriate technologies and helping countries to develop the innovative technologies that can help them when the political will is there to move in more climate friendly directions. And the second point is to go back to something that I think um, Jackie mentioned, adaptation. I mean, we, I mean, climate change is now and we really are going to have to deal with adaptation big time. It was one of the big, in my opinion, failures of Glasgow, but it can't last. And I think when it comes to adaptation, not telling people how to adapt, but helping them with the resources to implement their own methods for adaptation, that has got to be a much, much 
priority forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Navros. Uh, thanks, this is a, a, wonderful, a wonderful conversation. I, um, I want to very strongly endorse what, what Oren said uh, in terms of kind of the, the varieties that emerge uh, uh, in, in national context. And uh, I think uh, uh, agree with you, Catherine, when you said, you know, avoid these kinds of awful uh, terms like best practice and, and so on that, that, that imply that an easy transplant of, of, of models. Uh, that said, I just, you know, Oren's very provocative comment made me reflect a little bit. So, so uh, uh, one thing I've observed, uh, uh, Oren, you made the interesting uh, distinction between countries that sort of have law plus implementing mechanism sort of approaches and those who have, that tend to have more planning, uh, planning based uh, approaches. And I thought it was a very important distinction. But when I look across what countries are doing, it's kind of intriguing, as you said, that China has now adopted this uh, market-based system. The UK's law actually has really kind of planning overtones with five yearly carbon budgets. It's very, it's very uh, Chinese five-year planning, you know, um, uh, and then there's a mechanism behind that for each ministry to uh, talk about how its annual budget uh, its annual carbon budget will be met. That is then scrutinized by a centralized technical body, the Climate Change Commission. That is then debated in Parliament. So it's kind of an interesting hybrid, uh, um, and 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 we're seeing quite interesting models develop that 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 are blurring some of that uh, distinction. It just kind of occurred to me uh, as you were as you were speaking, and I was trying to apply those that distinction to countries that that I'm uh, have looked at a little bit in terms of what. The international system can do, um, you know, I think the starting point has to be figuring out how domestic jurisdictions can develop their own capacities to figure out what works within their own systems. Because we've seen so many examples uh, of long term strategies or action plans that are basically done by consultants that fly in from from overseas. I mean, in Indian states, uh, we just, you know, I, I, we've studied a few of the state action plans, speaking of adaptation, and you have somebody from a US university or a UK university coming in, uh, and literally they will show the Al Gore movie in the morning, um, uh, then, uh, you know, they compartmentalize the problem into, into seven or eight categories that broadly fall along uh, line divisions that bring in the so-called expert from each category, which may be local, and then off they, and then they're off to the races, and there's no kind of uh, uh, cross silo uh, interaction. There's no scope for creative thinking, and then it's handed over to a to a consultant to wrap it all up and and prepare a plan, uh, uh, with the assumption being that the consultant is best placed to frame this in the language that the international community will find attractive in order to bring in finance. Right. So that's the objective. It's not really actually about figuring out what works in local context. And here I've actually been very impressed by the South African experience. And speaking of, of, of local circumstance, I think the deliberative culture that has come in uh, in South Africa, partly because of the post of the apartheid struggle and the deliberative sort of ethos of the ANC in its early days, a lot of the climate planning and conversation tends to be much more deliberative in South Africa, trying to figure out what works. Uh, and now they have this presidential commission, the, a primary task of which is to actually structure deliberative uh, uh, conversations and figure out a transition past uh, past coal. So I, I'm rambling a little bit, but to say that the the focus really has to be on creating the uh, on supporting the capacity at home to figure out what what works. I mean that has to be the starting point. So maybe instead of having COP so much energy focused on the convention of the parties, there should be gatherings of the problem solvers from all of the nations of the world, regular gatherings at which they can uh, exchange what they're trying at home and report on how it's working and compare notes and so on uh, and build capacity through frequent interactions. Is there any kind of a clearinghouse or mechanism by which somebody who's trying to work out a plan in country A can um, readily be in touch with peers in other countries to see what they are doing and how it's working? Does that exist? Or is it simply done through professional networks? Would you like me to briefly 
Briefly, um, yes, yes, very briefly, because uh, then we'll go to Jackie. Yeah, yeah so th there are there are professional and civil society networks. Uh, WRI has a network, the NDC okay. Sport Initiative. There's something called the Low Emission Development Strategies Group. But again, okay. it tends to be quite heavily uh, consultant driven, uh, in my experience. Okay, great, thanks, Jackie. Yeah, I just wanted to add briefly to Navrod's points about capacity building, um, but just also to highlight that, yes, in the climate space, we don't really have an international level clearing house of policies. It does exist in other um, framework treaties, particularly uh, the biosafety regime. There's a clearing house mechanism that might be something to consider. But on the capacity building point, I yes, I definitely agree with the idea that we've moved away from the transplant model, even though that's often used in a lot of um, uh, interactions still between international finance institutions and projects that they're funding within uh, countries as Navros was describing. But what we often see as effective, particularly in the Pacific region, is the more peer-to-peer -peer, um, cooperation, um, sometimes called South-to-South -South uh, cooperation. In Pacific Islands in particular, the capacity problems are often the key. Uh, it, it's not that there are not laws um, or on the books, it's often a question of implementation and some creative use of limited resources to try and implement those requirements. And we found working with Pacific countries on a range of different issues that it's often um, learning from each other's experiences uh, about ways of doing things within their particular context that is more helpful. Um, you see similar kinds of cooperative peer-to-peer -peer networks emerging, um, particularly on the climate uh, issues between cities. Um, these have been really effective through C40, um, other organisations like ICLE, where you sort of have global mayors of cities gathering. Um, and that's often uh, based on sharing a very specific projects that are being undertaken in different cities, often on mitigation, but also increasingly around adaptation, urban greening, uh, city cooling. Um, so that those sorts of um, networks are very, uh, have been very effective. Um, and the other one to mention from another different sphere has been in the, in the finance area where we've seen the task force for climate related financial disclosures emerge sort of as a body under the G20. Um, but it almost operates to a private standard uh, setting function where um, there's a global grouping that's making recommendations on, on how financial disclosures should take account of climate risk. And that's filtered quite well through um, different financial systems and is being taken up increasingly. I think the, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US just recently um, released some new rules in this regard. So it's interesting to see how those processes are filtering, um, sometimes without a lot of involvement from a sort of centralised international structure. Thank you. And Tabitha, um, I'm glad you raised your hand. There's a question also that has been raised from the audience and is directed at you. Um, so I'll give you a chance first to say what you wanted to say, and then I want to tee up the question for you. Okay. Uh, I really just had a two finger on what all the other panels were saying. I think their remarks were great. And I agree with uh, you know pretty much everything they said. Um, I, I just all I wanted to say was I think uh, you know just in terms of the question of of how uh, governments can support kind of these like local initiatives I think it's important to um, uh, you know to you can provide incentives but it should be done in a really careful way so I think anytime you've got you know kind of whole scale like funding from the government of you know initiatives I've done a lot of work on subsidies and they can be really dangerous you know you just you get some you know, it essentially skews, you know, the bottom line and you just, you get, you get, you end up in areas, you know, in places where you don't necessarily want to be further down the road. But I think, you know, really carefully placed incentives, you know, to put solar panels on your house, to buy an electric car. I think, you know, we see a lot of that in certain states in the United States. I think that can be really effective. Mm -hmm. Great. So the question is um, to asking you to say more about how climate mitigation and adaptation uh, could have unintended effects on some of the South China Sea disputes. So for example, if you're trying to um, use adaptation measures uh, like fortifying islands against rising sea levels, 
then um, that could have consequences for determining uh, the territorial claims in the South China Sea. Uh, so China has, of course, been building up islands and rocks, although, as we know, not for climate adaptation, more for uh, building of um, military bases. But uh, thoughts about how climate mitigation or adaptation measures could actually have other unintended consequences? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And I, I think um, I, I would say that uh, really the buildup of the features has already done a lot of, you know, both the, the kind of political damage and the environmental damage. Um, so, you know, the, the, you know, the features have already, you know, been built up. Um, they, you know, under international law or not, are still, even though they've, they've been, uh, you know, altered uh, so that they're above the, you know, the surface level at all times, they're still under international law not to be considered islands um, uh, or even rocks that would generate some kind of maritime jurisdiction. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's the actions of the Chinese, I think, have already alarmed a lot of the other littoral states in the South China Sea. Uh, and, you know, the dredging that went on and, you know, just the activity, you know, that was uh, necessary in order to, you know, create the features and the landing strips on them. It's already done a lot of damage. And I, you know, in my opinion, um, it's all, you know, it's, it's kind of missing the, the point of what really needs to, to be done. Um, you know, there should be so much, you know, China is so focused on um, securing its claim to the South China Sea that that priority is, is, is much higher than, you know, any consideration of, of um, marine environmental conservation for the area. And I, and I think that's a, a loss, unfortunately. Um, and uh, I mean, I, you know, they're just, um, I, I think really more attention should be being paid to the fact that you know, a lot of people now think that the South China Sea might actually have levels of marine biodiversity that's greater than the Coral Triangle next door. And they're, they're a little bit different. The Coral Triangle um, tends to have like a lot of different coral species, but the South China Sea has some, some really rare species. And all of that is, is going to disappear most likely, you know, sadly. And then you're gonna have what was once, once one of the richest fishing grounds in the world you know, because the temperatures are changing, a lot of those species are going to be moving up, you know, north as they are in the rest of the world, and you're going to have, you know, jellyfish and maybe some shrimp left. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we ignore, um, you know, all those those other uh, issues on the table, kind of at our peril. Um, so, mm. that's a nice segue into another uh, audience question, which is basically whether more attention needs to shift to adaptation um, to because so many places are actually already uh, feeling the effects of climate change. And so there are urgent domestic and national issues such as food security, sea level rise, loss of coastal areas, near disappearance of small islands. Has the, and this I guess takes us back to the global level again, has the world community underemphasized those concerns in its focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I throw that out to anybody. Uh, Jackie. Um, it's certainly been the history of the international regime that it prioritised mitigation over adaptation for quite a long time. And so we're still, I mean, the Paris Agreement was an attempt to rebalance um, on the mitigation versus adaptation kind of divide that had emerged. And there is, I think um, at COP26, we saw a greater focus on adaptation discussion, though as Oren pointed to, not a lot of decision-making on uh, measures to support adaptation. Um, going towards the end of this year we'll see COP27 which is taking place in Africa and Egypt and the, um, the, the prediction is that we will see a lot greater focus on adaptation at that meeting which will be very important. Um, but I, I think that um, uh, it, it is incredibly important for us to keep um, 
adaptation in front of mind. But if we look at the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report from Working Group 2, they do emphasise, even though a lot of attention needs to be paid to adaptation, that you also need to continue to focus on mitigation because the clear message is that if we don't reduce greenhouse gas emissions and treat the problem, if you like, then yeah. um, we're, we're going to only be dealing with ever more uh, uh, dangerous and uh, difficult circumstances that may well over overwhelm our capacity for adaptation. Mm. Now, Rose. Uh, yes, so, so uh, thank you. So, so I think the adaptation agenda actually um, illustrates the importance of the organized UN-led international process in addition to what we're seeing increasingly, which are these sort of side deals and clubs and so on and so forth. Um, because the prospect for adaptation to be addressed through those kinds of club arrangements is even more, uh, even more limited because vulnerable countries have more of a voice in the structured environment of the, of the uh, UN FCC. Uh, what we've seen in the finance arena is, is uh, you know, much less in, uh, attention to adaptation than to, than to mitigation. And what we're beginning to see is actually kind of deals being made to help large emitters transition. And the, the notable example from Glasgow was a deal that South Africa struck very cleverly, I thought, uh, to get bilateral money, multilateral money, and so on for their coal transition. Um, so you see more and more of that happening because large emitting countries have the wherewithal to kind of to kind of put that together, and it's in the interests, uh, collective interest, to stimulate that that happening. You're not going to see those kinds of deals happening around adaptation finance uh, outside the UNFCC. So, so it's a it's a point about the importance of the UNFCC to make uh, to to continue giving adaptation some weight. Second observation on the domestic side I'd like to make is if we think the governance arrangements for mitigation are hard. In a sense, for adaptation, they're they're much harder, and we don't have templates. So the mitigation arrangements, you can kind of run a carbon thread through things and say, okay, every how, how do you internalize carbon in your decision making? You can't really do that around adaptation because there isn't a single metric. There's multiple varieties of vulnerability, uh, and and so how do you organize your institutions domestically? To, to account for those vulnerabilities is, is, really, is really challenging. So the, 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 the institutional challenges is, is, is even is heightened, if anything, on the adaptation side when you're looking at domestic uh, governance. That's a great point. So Oren, I think you're going to have the last substantive comment. Well, Jackie, of course, is right that we can't let up on mitigation. Navros is, of course, right that adaptation is harder, but on the other hand, climate change is happening and it's going to happen more and more dramatically. And the adaptation challenge is going to be hitting us right between the eyes. And so my answer to the question from the chat is, yes, we must take adaptation much more seriously than we have or we will pay a frightfully high price. Mm. Well, thank you all. I'm afraid we have come to time. So we have to end what has been a really uh, interesting and thought provoking conversation. Um, this will be, as you know, we've recorded this, will be on our website uh, in a few days. Um, so um, just to let everybody know, you can find it at the website. And I want to thank the audience as well for the great questions. And um, please consider joining us uh, for the next panel in this series, which is in less than 12 hours, actually, on Thursday morning, New York time, 9 a.m., when we will hear from two members of the International Law Commission's study group on sea level rise. And I can assure you that adaptation is going to be a very big topic. I think it's all going to be about adaptation for the rising sea levels, which are uh, a major problem, of course, in Asia Pacific. Uh, thank you, uh, a big thanks to all of you speakers. This has been just a fabulous conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs>